I'm going to start by telling you a story that has in some ways become a myth. And I'm not sure if it's perfectly accurate at this point, but I will tell you as it lives inside my soul. My mom likes to travel in a very specific way. It generally means having a stable base camp and a few trusted locals. And so whenever we would touch down somewhere, traveling as a young kid in 10, 11, 12, something in that range, I believe, she would always make friends with a taxi driver or some local, get their number, and we would basically hire this person to hang out with us while we were there. And this story starts in Ixtapa, Mexico, specifically Club Med. But I'll start by when we landed and met our taxi driver, Seltzo. The first thing anyone notices when being driven in Seltzo's taxi was his thumb. He held the steering wheel in a way where it protruded and you could see his very long thumbnail. And I remember as a kid asking him, why do you have a long thumbnail? And he said, Because I like it. (laughs) And the way he said it, very clearly indicating that's all you're going to get about this mysterious long thumbnail. But he drove us, and as my mom does, she won him over, like she pretty much does with everybody. And we now had a number to call Seltzo for just about anything one could possibly need, which might include taking your preteen son out on a authentic Mexican adventure, or at least a local Mexican's idea of what a preteen American's authentic Mexican adventure should entail. And so that's what happened. Seltzo picked me up. I was so excited. I had no idea what to expect. This is obviously a story that doesn't work in 2022. Like, can you imagine going to another company, getting a taxi driver? I mean, maybe it didn't work when it happened. I don't know, but it didn't seem out of place at the time. But just imagine these days for a second. Imagine if you flew to another country, met a taxi driver who took you from the airport to your resort, and then called the taxi driver to take your preteen child out on the town, basically. But that's the story. And and that's what we did. Seltzo pulled up in his taxi. I jumped in. He had this amazing music on. And I remember him showing me the CD cover. It was a burned CD. And I remember him showing me the cover, which was a, a white church on a sandy beach. It said something like, Iglesia La Bonita which I will try to dig up this burned CD. I'm sure I have it somewhere. And maybe we can even get some of the music to be playing in the background. He's playing this amazing music. I don't even know what you would call it, but it was very fun, Central American, rhythmic dance music. As we drove out of the resort town and into, I actually don't remember what town we went to, but a more authentic town, at least in in Seltzo's eyes. And um, we hopped out of the car and started doing stuff. I'll spare you the strip club details, but I will tell you that the story ends up at the bar of the strip club, where the bartender is bringing us beers and water and And when the bartender slash waitress asks if I want ice with my water, Seltzo puts his hand over the cup and says, no ice. (laughs) Now, when the waitress left, he went on to explain to me that the, the stomach is a furnace. It's meant to be hot. You never, ever put ice in water or ice in any of your drinks because why would you want to cool down your furnace? You got to keep it hot. I've never bothered to fact check that or see if there's any validity to that, but that has become a hard and fast rule from that day until now. That is still the case if you take me to a restaurant, hi, would you like some water? No ice. Sam would like no ice with his water because you got to keep the furnace hot. Seltzo is an interesting character in my life. 
because it led to this one moment that ends up with me changing the way I drink water probably until my dying day. But the character of Seltzo is not Seltzo. The character is my memory of the, the brief experience of this moment of time of being in the Extapa area in Mexico with a new guy who's taking me on an epic adventure for a 12-year-old or however old I was. But Celso is his own person with his own dreams and desires and experiences and trials and triumphs and loves and heartbreaks and victories and devastations and my point is just to say that when you're in a adolescent state of mind let's just say which is in no way saying that everyone grows out of this but just to say that i would attribute this way of thinking to a an adolescent way of thinking you see people as characters in your life because that's how it's experienced from the human experience you th- you see through your eyes that go into your body, into your memories and your body's memories, and you experience these brief moments of these people's experience in in some shared experience. Sorry to get crazy with this, but essentially what I'm saying is they become memories, that those shared experiences become characters in your drama, in your play, in your odyssey of your human experience. But eventually you start to realize that every single person you've ever interacted with, whether it be the barista that you've gone to for five years or the gym owner or the bus driver or the taxi driver or even that person that you bumped into on a subway one time 10 years ago, that every single person you've ever met has their own human experience. They have their own things that matter to them, their own things that they're going through. And obviously, you cannot hold that lens of seeing the world for (laughs) sustained periods of time. You will have to go back to your human experience. That is your base camp. But to, to expand your experience, to be able to incorporate the possibility that everyone that you experience has their own life going on. John Koenig coined the word in 2012, sonder, which is what I've just been speaking about. The realization that each random passerby is living a life as vivid and as complex as your own. We as humans are creatures of story. We collect them, we tell them, they're meaningful to us, and in some very real way, We are story. I think more than animal, we are a collection of stories. Our guest today was one of my Sunday school teachers. His name is Mark Iaconelli. And we did not go to the... How do I put this? We did not go to the highest production church. A lot of things were held together with with duct tape and love and care, but it was not, we didn't have the nicest facilities. We didn't have the um, most together programming, but Mark came in for a period of time and was kind of the superstar youth pastor. And what's funny is that I remember our time together very differently than he remembers it. And part of that is because of this phenomenon that I'm talking about, that all of our experiences and all the way that we can take in other people's experiences are still rooted in the central experience of me, of I. And this interview was fun because in a way it's like, it's like part of the journey of going back to your genesis and revisiting these things that you just assumed were concrete, which, by the way, can be a dangerous adventure. I'm not saying you should go into such adventures carelessly. It turns out while 
Mark Iaconelli was coming to church and inspiring me and always finding a smile that he had his own stuff going on, his own losses, his own hardships. And what I experienced was him momentarily transcending those hard experiences to come and deliver an amazing experience for 12-year-old me or however old I was. There's also the funny added part of this, which is that I had remembered our time with me being the still being the bright-eyed good boy and talking to him revealed something different. And so this is a fun journey. Not only is Mark a great author, who's the author of a new book, Between the Listening and the Telling. It's a good book. And this is a good man. He's also somebody that had become a character in my life. And to revisit that with him in this discussion, I hope playfully encourages you to revisit some of the characters in your life. And some of them you won't get to have a conversation with, but to get to meditate on the idea that, wow, that person that came and knocked my socks off for a speech that one time at a school assembly, like that person had a life. I wonder what it was. And the next time you're in traffic and someone is acting like a total dickhead, you can look over to them and go, wow, I wonder, I wonder what their mom's like. I wonder what it was like to be raised as them. And so here is my conversation with Mark Iaconelli, which is a, a fun and deep conversation between two generations of men, one who helped mentor the other, but reflecting now back on that time and on their own lives together as adult men. Hey, Mark. Hi, Sam. It's been a little time. Since it's I've been seen a long time. 20 years, maybe? Yeah, you yeah. are an interesting character in my life because you come from the, like, the, the, the black hole zone of, of my life because I was, oh. I was high from 12 to 22, pretty much. And okay. um, I think we met before I started using drugs. Is that you know, did I don't know. Did I, you get a druggy vibe from me? <laughs> 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 well, you know, it's hard to know when you're with, you know, young teenagers, what the, where the druggy vibe is. You know, there's yeah. a lot of experimentation going on with personality and all kinds of stuff. But um, no, I, I, you know, I met you in this Sunday school class that you, I think you were brought there against your will probably. And um, a lot, sometimes it was just you and me. Sometimes it was you and me and maybe two other kids or something like that. And, you know, you had that kind of feeling of, like, I, I, I'm, I'm a hostage here. You know, you're looking at the clock, trying to figure out how to get out of there. And, you know, I had a lot of empathy for you. It's like, yeah, this is not uh, something I would want to be doing if I was 13 years old, be here at this or 12 years old. So I don't know what the, what the drug use was, whether that was happening or not. Um, I just knew I have to figure out how to find life in this person because you were shut down is what I remember. You, you were, you were there, not there. Oh, wow. Okay. So, but, but, which is not unusual for teenagers, you know, at that age, just go like, okay, whatever this is. It's kind of the school persona. Like I'm in school, my body's here, but I'm not here. And, um, so I had to, and you, and I could tell you'd already been through this routine of whatever church and Sunday school. So I had to try to find ways to shake it up. So I think one time I remember saying, hey, let's go play a game with those yogurt cups. And you were like, what? I was like, yeah, let's take these yogurt cups outside. We're going to invent a game. And I think we went running around the sanctuary playing a cat. You know, we had to catch things kind of like, um, I don't know, some kind of game we played. And that kind of thought, I, I had to try to get you, knock you off balance is what I remember trying to do. And like, okay, so you don't want to come to church. You had a great line. You said, uh, what kind of God needs to be worshipped? Like this sounds, <laughs> that sounds like me. Yeah, you're like, this is a very insecure God. And I thought that was a great line. And uh, so I was like, okay, so if you had to spend this day doing something that was connecting to the ultimate love of the universe, what would you do? And I remember you saying, I'd go to the ocean. 
I would just spend the day at the ocean. And I remember talking to the church, like, could we just take these kids to the ocean? Like, do they have to stay here? And the answer was yes, they have to stay here. But, uh, but that's the kind of stuff I was trying to figure out. Where are you? Yeah. Yeah. So the cool thing about talking to you, you have access to these moments of myself that are so fragmented. Mm-hmm. Like so, it's so hard for me to recall and that could be some kind of strange, you know, I've had therapists be like, this is a, this is trauma and you're, you're repressing memories to maybe it was just physically just not recording the data properly uh-huh. <laughs> or whatever it was, or I just have a bad memory, which, you know, yeah, is also possible. Yeah. Um, but uh, so like you, you have a, a glimpse at a, a part of myself that I don't get to hear about often. This is about you, obviously. Yeah. Well, this episode, but it's, it's cool to have somebody that has a, a more sober and coherent, well, and I'd rather just have this conversation, so I don't, I don't need it to be about me, because like I said, well, I haven't got to talk to you since those moments, so I remember, so I have images of, yeah, and I don't know what you're going to keep out of all this, but, you know, um, of you shut down, and me, and, and to me, this was like an interesting puzzle, so it was like, okay, because like I said, I was in sympathy with you, like, this is not an exciting room, this is not a great place, it's early Sunday morning, you'd rather be sleeping, I get it. Okay, so how do we come alive? Okay, let's play a game. Okay, let me ask you some weird question. Okay, what if we could kill this God? How would we kill this God? You know, I was trying to come up with questions that would kind of, and you would, you would show up once in a while. Like I'd see you like (laughs) come to the surface. Like, what did you just say? Or what did you ask me? Or actually, you know, or you'd be surprised by some thought would come in your head. And I would see you kind of go, well, actually, this is what I would do. You know, I would just, you know, leave. That would kill God. You know, you'd come up with things like that. And I'd say, okay, he, there he is. You know, now he's talking to me for real. So I was trying to find ways like that, like let's have a real conversation. And it's kind of like Aikido. Like if you were, you hate this, all right, let's hate it together and let's find something else. But, uh, you know, I mean, also you were hurting. You know, I could tell that. You know, really? So, oh, yeah. Yeah, you were hurting. Did I give you any indication what I was hurting about? Well, you know, It's just, you know, so we have different, what do we do with hurt? You know, sometimes we just shut down. It's too much or it's overwhelming or I don't want to, I don't want to feel this right now or I need a break or whatever. So I could tell, um, yeah, you're hurting and I didn't know what it was or the source of it. I know anything. It was just, you know, hour and a half, a week or something I was with you. So, so I just was waiting to see if it might show up, you know, but I could tell. This wasn't good. So how can we have a conversation that's interesting and a life-giving? Or how can we play? Let's play something. Let's just do something fun and uh, try to alleviate that a little bit, you know. Um, I, I think I called your mom one time and said, hey, I'm doing this crazy weird camp up in Washington. It's You have to take a boat to get to it. They don't have any cars there. It's in the middle of nowhere, you know, and was trying to figure out. I had, didn't go, did I? You didn't go. No. Damn her. <laughs> Damn that woman. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out, like, okay, so would that be a place? Because there was other teenagers I knew who were going there. I thought, ah, Sam, might, he might like this. He might find some some people there who are... If I had gone to that camp, yes, I would have graduated college. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and I wouldn't have become a meth addict. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. You, you know, it you also, you also might have hated it. Yeah. It's funny. So I actually thought when I was trying to remember our time together and we'll get to the interview, but this is good stuff. Yeah. And I don't look anything like, I don't even know if you remember what I, you know, cause I'm so yes, much older. You were yeah. the young, spry, <laughs> That's right. cool, uh, church youth pastor. Yeah. The one and only at that church. Yeah. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings if they listen, but you were like the one who like showed up. I don't know if you're caffeinated or like ready to go. Like yeah. You, you, mm-hmm. It was not uh, a dull experience, but it's it's funny to hear that I was already this angsty, maybe depressed, more guy. depressed than angsty. Of course, you know, this is Sunday morning, so you're you're sluggish, you're tired, you're being dragged to church. You know. Yeah, it was not church. Yes, that was where I was. Yeah, uh, yeah. That was just a a period that I I, I never grew out of. I still feel that way all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, 
I thought I thought it was from the like very like innocent sweet part. But it sounds like you came later. No, in the mix. I came. Yeah, yeah. I think at that time your mom was trying to figure out where which school you should go to. Even you know, had I gotten kicked out of a school? You yet? might have gotten kicked out of a school. I might have. Some, wow. Yeah. So All right. And then like I, you know, we were talking a little bit before this. Like so, so you know, I would look for any signs of sometimes signs of Sam show up. You know, and. I remember, and I don't know where this was in your journey because you know, we haven't kept in touch or anything like that, but I remember seeing a sculpture you made out of knives. And like I said, you know, it just stuck in my brain because it was just like a missing piece from earlier. It was kind of like, this is something really interesting. Like there's, you know, just, just how did you work with it? You know, how did you not cut yourself? Are these sharp? You had done really interesting things with them. How did you start working with these the first time? And there was some kind of, it communicated something to me about you that, and about all of us, actually, that I thought was really truthful. And I thought, okay, there it is. He's on to it. Like, he's on to something alive here. And this is going to be really good. <laughs> it was a wing made out of blades. Okay, that's that, what it was. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And it would have been two wings had I more money, time, and patience. But it's one wing. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a single wing. It was striking. It was beautiful, but it was just dangerous. And um, and just, I don't know, you know, it's like the way art does, you can't really put it into words because the object itself communicates it. But it was something visceral that I felt when I saw it, which was just like, and I felt glad for you. I was like, okay, whatever the hell this is, even if it's coming out of darkness, this is good. Like, stay there. <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting chapter of art. So there was a guillotine that followed that. Okay. There was a bear trap with toilet plunger legs, like okay. a mechanical walking bear trap thing. And then there was the knives made out of wings, or the wings <laughs> made out of knife blades. Now, where did that come from? Well, the, the knives in particular were like me trying to work through betrayal mm. you know and it's like mm. those those knives were all the times i got backstabbed and i mm. got you know i ended up blazing my own trail you know i didn't listen to any of the adults in my life mm -hmm. which i don't know if some kids just come out that way that that's they just have to learn the hard way mm -hmm. but i didn't follow any guidance so i ended up really meeting some dangerous and malevolent characters and that had led to like really serious betrayals and backstabbings. And so those those were the knives like in in my back that I had reshaped into something less ugly. But I mean, but the image itself though is there's beauty to it. I mean, I feel that danger and stuff because they look like, I kept wondering like, how did you not cut yourself? But Welding gloves. Okay. Because like, you're welding them all together. So every, oh, okay. everything's dangerous in the process. Okay. But why that image? I mean, you could have done something that the whole thing was just uh, like incredibly violent or destructive looking, but it's a wing. And, and so that's so evocative and even spiritual or there's a freedom to it or I don't know, this, these are my associations. But what, what was it? Why a wing? Um, I, well, I think the wing was, was something hopeful, mm -hmm. you know, and something beautiful and something that you could be proud of. Mm -hmm. right as opposed to the the shame of screwing up but mm -hmm. all my art was like you know it wasn't art school level stuff it was like really primitive and just raw and, and uh literal like but i like you know they were all dangerous i built a working guillotine mm -hmm. like you you could kill yourself with it mm -hmm. and it it was just something that was um I don't know, the, the seriousness of that physical object matched the seriousness of my inside world at that time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if we had talks about it when I was 12 or 13 or whenever we started hanging out, but, mm -hmm. you know, death has always been right in the forefront of my mind. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like when I found a lot of comfort in Christianity er earlier, before we met, because there was a time where it wasn't like I was a Christian because mom was telling me so. It was like I was a Christian because I had 
weighed out the options and I really liked the afterlife and the idea of the afterlife and the, you know, you tune into Christian content, right? Documentaries and movies and TV shows. And, um, you know, there's often this idea that there's more and it's Mm -hmm. not just the end. And for a kid who would lay at, lay at night and just, essentially meditate deeper and deeper and deeper into what does not existing look like. Mm. That was beautiful. But anyway, Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, so so I'm really grateful for this conversation. I mean, for, for a number of reasons, but, but one is like, and you made some comment about like, well, this wasn't whatever, like trained art or whatever, but, it's so honest and real. And I, I don't know what art is. I'm not an artist. But my hope is that to encounter things that sort of wake me up or bring me to the truth, even if it's a dark truth, or make me feel more alive. You know, like like what I hope for myself is not to be in that numb state. And I put myself in that state a lot, like watching television or <laughs> eating food or scanning social media or I don't know, other mindless times, but it's so great to be awake. And like, that's what I'm feeling when you're describing this, like the wing of knives, there's something there, you know, that's just beautiful. And what's, what, um, when you say like you're meditating on death and and Christianity in some ways is a meditation on death. Like you go into a Catholic church and there's a dead body on the cross in the front, a tortured dead body. And we're just going to look at this thing every Sunday, you know? And there's something, you know, like, thank you for telling me the truth, right? If you walk into a church and you see that tortured dead body, it's like, that's real. This is what life is like many times. This is what's happening to many people on our planet. This is what's happening to the planet itself. You know, it's this kind of death and suffering. And um, and then you see what, what arises in the presence of it. So that's why it's interesting to me, you say, like, what arises in the meditation on betrayal is hope or a wing. And I wonder, like, when you're saying, when you're younger, you're meditating, like, what's like to not exist? And you're holding that against these images of the afterlife. But I wondered if they were disconnected for you, though. Like, it's like one's a set of stories of the afterlife or beautiful images or whatever. Or did the images feel like they were in connection to the annihilation or the sense of death with what drew me to Christianity. Yeah. I think it was just the, the hope of, of it all, Mm -hmm. you know, there's some promise or hope. Yeah. There's some promise or hope. And it's actually, I I wish it was emphasized as an adult looking back. I wish it was emphasized way less. The hope and all that in the afterlife. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I really have come to love and enjoy the Bible as you know, I do what, like a moral reading, less so okay. than a spiritual reading. Mm-hmm. But it's it's basically a library of books, it, right? You know, and it's like I don't, it's it's not one book. It's like a library of everything these people thought were important. Mm-hmm. And there's so much utility in it. Like in my 30s, I I see that more than in my 20s. In my 20s, I was a raging atheist, yeah, who would love to tell you how silly you are <laughs> and, well and, and you might be right on a lot of levels so i don't think so <laughs> yeah um there's a lot of silliness in christianity or ridiculousness or harm yeah oh, and i oh, consider yeah. myself a christian and a lifelong christian but you know yeah, yeah there's there's a lot of that in humans yes yeah i'm not sure one outdoes the other yeah you know like but see, I see like the story of Jesus, and again, maybe this is all get edited out, but I see like what if that became an image, like an artistic image of the of the soul's journey? So you think like we're all born, you know, under threat, you know, like Jesus is in the in the, in the manger, and we're all uh, tempted by all these, you know, like when the Satan takes Jesus out and gives him all these temptations, sort of these false temptations. And then we're all kind of headed towards this death on the cross and betrayal, right? So, and that th- that's the soul's journey. And the only way you actually know the afterlife is if you go through that death and suffering. That otherwise, it's just a story. 
unless you actually know it for real. I mean, I feel like, I mean, I've listened to your podcast. You're someone who knows something about death and resurrection at some level. I mean, you've gone through suffering, suffering and in the stories I've heard you tell and um, things falling apart or your sense of self not working anymore. And then you had to kind of go through that and rebuild. And when you speak from that place, I hear a lot of truth or a lot of reality that you know. And that there's kind of a death and resurrection there. Or no, am I getting that wrong? Or am yeah, I, I, I think it, it really works well from a utility standpoint. Oh, that's how you, okay, that's what you mean. In this lifetime, okay. in this one lifetime. I really believe yeah. like heaven and hell, those are here. Okay. You know, not to... No question your faith at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, but you know, I have been in in hell mm. during this lifetime. So, how did that hell match what you thought it might be when you were younger? I was never really worried about going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> not because I was so great. Yeah, but uh. Fear was just not the the motivation. Mm -hmm. I I think I wasn't even motivated necessarily to get to heaven. Right. I was motivated to have something after this. Uh -huh. Get this over with. Some extender of time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, if, if my consciousness here is going to end someday, can we can we extend that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is funny because consciousness for me has been a mixed bag. It's been really painful. I have. Uh, I don't know, you know, how much of it is nature or nurture, but, um, you know, if you want to talk about like where people wake up and what their general mood is, like m mine is, I think, lower than the average person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Either that or people are just really good at covering it up, <laughs> you know, but right. I, w I wake up in, um, in pain often and despair often. And, um, you know, often getting into the day is about like, figuring out how to go from there to something more manageable. But the baseline is, is low. So mm -hmm. it's funny that I would want more or maybe the promise of relief. But anyway, let's start. <laughs> we're going. Okay. I know. I'd rather have this conversation, but. We will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. We're not going to change a thing. Okay. But I am going to ask the first question I always ask, which in this case is not the first question. But Mark, who are you? Um, well, I mean, if I could, the first thing is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm someone who wants to be a good friend, I'm someone who wants to serve my community, I'm someone who wants to love, but, uh, but I love badly. That's what comes to me. <laughs> what do you mean, what do you mean by love badly? <sighs> um... I sometimes, you know, sometimes I, I fool myself. I think I'm doing something for someone else. It's actually for me. Or um, somebody is giving me a lot of signals that they need some care, and I either don't pick them up or I don't want to pick them up. I don't, I don't, I don't listen um, because I want to do my own thing. So there's a way in which I am still trapped in myself that can make me incredibly depressed or sad sometimes or... Or kind of filled me with yearning, like, you know, will I ever get free of my habits of thought and, and being, you know, I'm 55, it's getting close here. So like, <laughs> is there, is there, is it, is this going to happen or not? You know? <laughs> so as, as somebody like, as I, I think it was Freud would call it the ego ideal, right? Like when you close your eyes, there's that kind of like that, that person that you see that you, you could be if you tried really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, what are, what is the direction that you're steered towards? Well, you know, so I guess what's painful, and I don't know about how you experience this or not, but I have little moments where I'm free. I mean, just little glimpses. I mean, it might be just I'm sitting having coffee on the back deck, and I just have forgotten myself for a moment. And I'm just taking in the clouds and the light, and I'm kind of just, I'm not having any critical thoughts of myself or others. There's just kind of a gentleness kind of descends. And I'm grateful for my life and I feel alive in a beautiful way. And then it goes away, right, immediately. And so I want to be in that space a lot more. And there are times when I'm with people like that too, where it's like I have all the time in the world for this person. I, I feel generous. I feel patient. I'm not annoyed 
by mouth sounds or, you know, or, you know, um, what they're wearing that day or the fact that they're not cleaning the kitchen the way I asked, you know, or something like that, where I'm just not in that reactive space. I'd like to not be in a reactive space. I'd like to be more um, just free and open and accepting. But I tend to be controlling. That's often uh, what I'm praying for. And I pray now, too. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to be more patient and more kind. And it's a real struggle. You know, my girlfriend lives in England right now. Okay. She's a screw up with her work visa. Okay. And um, she would come to visit and I'd still be focused on you're washing the dishes wrong. Yeah. Because I use a three sponge system. <laughs> Right. And it's the best way. I mean, it is scientifically the best way. Right, right. You know, I don't know Here, how many sponges you, you use. Yeah. Three sponges is the correct amount of sponges. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when she's gone, when she's back in England, you think, oh, I'm such an idiot. Right. Because like, cause something, you know, the edge is off it. And you go, why did that matter to me so much? Yeah. So that's often the same things, you know, if I think about how could I grow next year? It's generally, yeah, trying to be more patient and kind. And for those listening, that's like, that's not actually, like, I think I have a lot of moments of being a really patient and kind partner and a mm -hmm. patient and kind father, mm -hmm. patient and kind son, patient and kind friend sometimes. But, you know, the people who are in my life, it's like, you cannot compare to what you hear from this show, to, to what it's like to be with me. As mm -hmm. I imagine you cannot compare what you, the listener, the person listening right now, uh, what you share publicly to, to what it's like to really be with you. We're like, you know, these really screwed up people. Yeah. At and least like, a lot of us. Yeah. Yes. And I'm one of them. You know, so sometimes, you know, you just get lucky, right? You just happen to be in that patient, generous space. Other times I've noticed, like, not that I stay faithful to this, but I can do a couple things to get myself in that space. Like maybe take a moment outside before I interact with others or take a walk or get better sleep or something like that. Sometimes those things kind of help me. Usually for me, it's, I don't really allow myself to receive much love. I don't, you know, I, I, it's like the aperture on a camera, like it's pretty tight. I mean, uh, so we just had Father's Day not too long ago. My daughter wrote me this really beautiful card and I noticed I, I just scanned it because I noticed it was really heartfelt, really beautiful things, and it was too much, you know. And it was just a little thing I noticed, like, why can't I just slow down and read this thing? And uh, so I brought it actually with me, <laughs> you know, just like carry it around, like, slow down. She just try, she wants to tell you these things. Just take it in. It's really hard, and I think it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not conscious, it's my nervous system, my body, everything sort of says, don't look directly at it. Yeah. You'll be annihilated by love. <laughs> uh, a previous guest on the show, Gay Hendricks, would say, oh, that's your upper limit. Like right where you look mm -hmm. away. Like that's your, mm -hmm. that's your upper limit. It's a great episode. Just, yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think you'd get a kick out of it. Yeah. I have to ask though, because... One of the interesting things about growing up and becoming an adult is when we met in the mind of 12-year-old or 13-year-old Sam, you're just a character in my life. Right. Right? You're just this, <laughs> the fun uh, Sunday school teacher who tried harder than all the other Sunday school mm. teachers. I remember you ended up moving, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So you ended up moving, and I was bummed because it meant we huh. were going to go back to just like you were really right. adaptive and really like, right. like I think you explained pretty well trying to work with what I showed up with. Right. And so I was, I was bummed when you left, but as an adult, now you, you look at those people that were just a character in your life and you go, like, I wonder who that guy was like really besides just who you were in the Sunday school room. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about how the hell you got here, because there's, you know, this, this show is kind of, multiple parts but one of the things i love to hear is is the journey your new mm -hmm. book between listening and telling is about stories mm -hmm. and I, I like to hear you know there are shows that i think do a good job of just saying hey this is what i think you should do and that's not 
um, what I'm drawn towards, I kind of want to know, well, how'd you even come up with that to begin with? Mm -hmm. And well, you know, it's interesting because I, you know, I, you and I have been trying to get the exact time we were together, but, but right around that time, my dad died in a car accident. So I know I was, and so, and it was sudden and I was really close to my dad. So I was grieving during that time. And then my daughter was born right around that time. So it was also chaos at home. You know, it was like, she was up all night with this beautiful daughter while I was kind of in this massive grief, you know, at that, at that time that you didn't see and I wasn't showing, you know. Um, so, so, you know, my story is, uh, is a lot about my dad. You know, I'm the eldest. My dad was this very charismatic figure. There, there's a way, in fact, I felt connected to you. My dad was not a, as big of a celebrity as your mom, but he was in these certain circles. Like he would speak at these conferences, 3,000 people, 5,000 people, stuff like that. He was, he was, uh, sort of the godfather of youth work or youth ministry in the church. So he wrote all these curriculums. He was a dynamic speaker. He won the National Toastmaster speaking contest. He was incredibly funny and, and uh, alive and dynamic. And he was a guy who didn't put up with bullshit. So he loved the Christian life, but he, he also had a magazine that mocked and made fun of Christian leaders. It was, it didn't take advertisements. It was kind of this crazy, mad magazine of Christianity. So there was a lot of humor in it, too. And I just loved the guy. You know, I just loved being around him when I could get any time. And I loved watching him speak and kind of do his thing. He was on the road all the time. And um, so a lot of my life was formed by that absence. His dad was really fun, but he's not, he's not really accessible or he's mm. not really here. And um, yeah, I, I'm having other memories. I can't relate to that at all. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it was funny because, you know, your mom might have been at her peak around that time. Like, I think she was on the cover of People, People's Magazine around that time, like Traveling are Mercies. You, are you saying it's all downhill? <laughs> well, I mean, in terms of her celebrity career, yeah. she was on, uh, she just really launched around that time. And, um, and I remember being at, like, Christian education meetings. She would talk about you, and I'd pull her aside. And I didn't really know her, and I was kind of in awe of her, her success and stuff. But I said, you shouldn't talk about Sam in these meetings. Like, there's a lot of groupies in these meetings, actually. They're like, they're saying they're here to teach Sunday school, but they're actually here to be around you. And so I wouldn't make jokes about Sam or talk about Sam. And I remember writing her a long email about that, too. Because I had had the same thing happen to me. My dad would use me. And I'm that guy now, too. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Right, because your son's 12 or 13. Yeah. 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 So I, I remember having a couple of conversations with her about that. And I, she wrote something, and I said, ah, I would take this out, like, and, um, she didn't. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> no. not if it worked. Yeah. <laughs> not if it worked. You know. Um, yeah. So I. So that. That's why I felt a similarity to you in some ways. You know, because I was like, "Wow, he's got to carry that." You know, he has. He's the. He's. Everybody knows about Sam's. You know, growing up. Yeah, I'm 32 years old, and people will still introduce me at a party as Anne Lamont's son. Yes. Yeah. The so, question is, will I ever be Sam? Yes. Right. Yeah. So that's, I went into the same profession as my dad. So I would be at these massive conferences, same thing. Mike, Mike Iaconelli's son, Mike, Mike Iaconelli's son. I spoke at this thing. They asked me to be the keynote speaker in England. It was like 5,000 people at this conference, at this uh, Christian festival called Greenbelt. And um, I was like, wow, I can't believe they're asking me to do this. You know, so I'd written my first book and, they only wanted me there because my dad had died. And I remember all these people laying on the grass. And when the talk got over, they all, all these people lined up. They all wanted to say something about my dad. Nobody said anything about my talk. And one of the people said, you know why we're all laying on the grass? Because your voice sounds like him. And we wanted to hear him. So I know a lot of this you know, yeah. you're talking about where I had to struggle with that kind of thing. So, so my life story is a lot about, um, and I tell it in the book, a lot of that relationship. And luckily, before he died, I, I got really pissed at him and confronted him about a lot of these dynamics. Cool. We, we went to the coast for three days. How close to the end did you wait? Uh, this was a year before he died. Cool. I'll, so, I'll wait about that time, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Annie, if you're listening, whenever he confronts you, you got one year yeah. from that moment. But, um, yeah, yeah, we went to the coast, and I just blasted him about, like, you were not here for this, and I'm upset about this and this stuff, and... 
And he, he started to leave at one point. He was so hurt, you know. But I was really grateful for that because he did stick it out and was willing to hear my side of the story. And, um, and yeah, I guess it was a year from then. We, we kind of marked it, spent a day together, and then I think a month or two after that, he was in a car accident. And I got to kind of finish that up. So I went and I followed my dad in his profession. I went into youth work. I went into the church. And there were a lot of really beautiful things about that. And I felt like I grew up with a healthy form of Christianity. Um, but, uh, you know, my dad was a speaker. I wanted to get into contemplative practices, which, which are about silence and meditation. So I went that route. And so I was hanging out with monks and nuns and trying to figure out this mystical side, which was, was in a way a kind of fuck you to my dad. Like, I'm going to be in the silence and solitude. You're this big speaker. I'm going to go the other way. But it was also a way I was trying to chart my own path. Yeah. So I did that for a while. And eventually I found the success I wanted. You know, eventually I earned my way to the same platforms my, my dad had. And that's when I had a breakdown. <laughs> you know? I can't relate to that at all either. <laughs> I mean, <I'm> not, <laughs> well, first of all, I've never gotten close to where my mom well, is, I mean, obviously. Yeah, but in, in, in the little world I was in. Uh, yeah, I I, I kind of hit the peak there. I was on ABC News, World News Tonight, with Peter Jennings, you know, and I'd done this work, and pretty much about a month after that, everything fell apart, and I lost my faith. I lost my sense of self. It was you know because that's what was driving me. I thought I was on this spiritual journey, uh, which I was in a sense, but I was also trying to get my dad's attention trying to heal that dad wound. And when I reached that success, it became obvious to me what was really driving me. And I was ashamed and lost my bearings of who I was or what was going on. Um, dark night of the soul. Dark night of the soul. You want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah. I mean, it's funny you mentioned that. Like, um, I got really interested in dark night of soul around that time because... I mean, uh, what I started learning is there was, like I would look down, everything seemed to be falling apart. I didn't really have a sense of faith. I didn't have a sense of myself. Um, I was hard to live with. But if I looked down, my heart was still trusting. Like I hadn't, I wasn't in a kind of a, I wasn't in a fucked up place. I mean, I was just, it was just that, everything I believed about myself had fallen apart. But a deeper part of myself was still still moving forward and still had a sense of love and acceptance. You know, it, it was holding the mess that I had become. And my understanding of the dark night of the soul is that's what happens. It's like all your ideas of God and ideas of yourself turn to sand and blow away. But there's a deeper reality. Ash. Ash. I like, did you ever read Iron John by Robert Boyle? Yes. Yeah. I love that imagery of doing the ash work. Yes. Yeah. But there's, a, if you allow it and don't resist it, there's a sort of deeper truth that's waiting to emerge. And that's what happened for me. Yeah. Whereas all of a sudden, the only thing that comforted me was just silence. If I could just be in silence, that felt honest. Everything else I didn't trust, anything I said, anything I thought, anything around me, I didn't really put much weight in, but I trusted the silence. Yeah. What did it look and feel like to lose your faith as a youth yeah. minister? Is that the title? Help, help well, me. at the time, you know, we're here in San Anselmo. I was at the seminary here in San Anselmo, San Francisco Theological Seminary. I had just developed this national platform where I was teaching these contemplative uh um, practices to all the major denominations, all your downtown churches, your Lutheran, Presbyterian, Methodist. I've been on these news shows. The Wall Street Journal did a two-page thing. And this is right when everything falls apart, right as everything is finally built. You know, And I have this program, and I have this a huge grant to do this work. I have book contracts. But I don't, I meanwhile feel that I'm full of shit, and I don't know what's real and what's not. I've lost my bearings. I'm in that dark night. Yeah. I, I can't tell what's real. At the time, I had two colleagues, you know, who were like, who could 
see what was going on. And beautifully, they just said, okay, well, let's start the work day just sitting in silence for a half hour with you. Was it a secret? Um, not to them. Okay. Not to them. And so... In a seminary, can you say, I'm, I'm questioning my faith? Is that kind of like a frowned um, upon? Most of the seminary didn't care about what I was doing. So nobody would ask, no, you know, the okay. other uh, the professors. I was kind of doing this project on the side of it that uh, was its own thing. Um, yeah, and I, I guess, yeah, yeah. And, and then the spirituality, there was, a, there was a Catholic nun there, Elizabeth Liebert and others. You know, they would look at me like, yeah, this happens. Yeah, this is part of it. You know, you know I was, I was uh, 33. So I was a year older than you. And that's, you know, I don't know if you know this, but Carl Jung and others talk about your Jesus year. So I was in my Jesus year. I'm just, you know, <laughs> nothing. I don't have to do anything too serious. I'm just waiting for that 33 to cash in. Your Jesus year is coming. Yeah. That's right. And um, so they just sat with me in, in silence and slowly. Uh, there was a contemplative musician who did this like meditative music. He used to do retreats with me. And I would tell him like, when I'm up there, I don't even believe what I'm saying, you know. <laughs> kind of a problem. Huh? Yeah. Well, and the stuff I was saying was like I was teaching these practices mostly. Like, okay, so we're going to do these things. This comes out of this tradition, and this is what can happen. And this is probably a lot of stuff that's said on this podcast, you know, about the ego relaxing, all this kind of stuff. But I didn't know. I didn't believe any of it. or I, I didn't know what I was saying was true or not. I didn't believe it. It's just that I didn't know what was real and what wasn't. And the musician said to me one time, and I told him, like, I don't know if I can keep doing these retreats. And he said, do you think I'm feeling it every time I'm playing these damn meditative songs? They're incredibly boring. You know, <laughs> <laughs> in these prayer songs, they're not musically interesting. The words aren't interesting. It's not about me. It's about the people. The people need me to sing this song, so I sing this song. So he's like, do your job. That helped a ton. And it also kind of lowered my sense of self, too. Like, I'm nothing special because I'm a spiritual teacher. A plumber can bring water into your home. That's pretty magical. That's pretty amazing. I don't know how to do that. You know, you know somebody can bring electricity in this room. That's amazing. I'm just a guy who knows how to teach these practices and lead them. I don't have to feel like I am believe every word and I'm sensing God's spirit and everything. Just do your job. And... The people want you to do this job. Just do it. That's how I slowly got healed. I didn't put any sparkles on it anymore. I just it's funny. I was listening to a like a national speaker. This is what this guy does. And he, he happens to have a cross-section audience where he'll end up at all Christian audiences okay. and all atheist audiences. Okay. And he said one of the funnier observations was when he goes to the uh, the atheist kind of audiences and he asks, how many of you question your belief in there not being a God? Very few hands go up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he goes to the Christian audience and he goes, how many of you question your faith in a God? He said, almost everybody's hands go up. Yeah. So he said, you know, there's, you know, not to extrapolate too far in that, but the the belief in, in falling out of belief is a really, I think it's a healthy process. And it's a, it's an editing process, I think, too, you know, yeah, for the individual to figure out what is sacred to them. What do they want? You know, we happen to be a species that gets to choose to some degree what we believe. Yeah. You right. know, and there's, there's some events that can happen that are not your choice that can totally change your beliefs. You know, it could be a traumatic event or it could be a, you know, a, a holy event for you, but for a lot of life, like, you know, you, you get to decide. And I, 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 I love the, the idea that, that these, the questioning is part of the magic, you right? Know, the yes. exploration and figuring out, cause I'll, I'll tell you, you may have heard this. If you listen to the show, I'm sorry to everybody listening or watching. Um, I was an atheist for four years and basically I got sober. I was a very, very, pious meth head right <laughs> okay very uh, ambulance would go by i'd do the little you know i'd do the oh, thing okay. I'd say a prayer for whoever the ambulance is picking up i got sober i, I was just an atheist i was like what the f what the yeah. hell mm -hmm. you know no they, we're just a bunch of naked apes on this rock right and what happened was is i was about four years sober i saw a lot of people getting sober kind of going with the program getting some higher power, you know, moon, ocean, right. Jesus, all different kinds of gods. 
uh, but like really doing the deal, praying and meditating. And there was just no arguing that the guys that had gotten sober at the same time than me that were doing it were living better than me. Mm-hmm. So I started praying, meditating very ambivalently. Mm-hmm. And um, I still have no conception of what I'm praying to. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that I love the theologists. I love people that take these old messages mm-hmm. and find ways to make them relevant to contemporary audiences. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things I've, I've noticed a lot is, you know, we're a lot of the problems we're solving are problems of our own making of becoming less religious. Mm-hmm. You know, like um, there was a period of time where, you know, I, I had waited a long time to lose my virginity mm-hmm. and uh, sex was like this very sacred thing. And I got totally fucked over, right? Like, had sex with the wrong person. Uh-huh. And, um, and there was a period of my life where I just had sex with anybody that would let, let me, pretty mm-hmm. much. Everybody mm-hmm. uh, did all the things on my bucket list. Mm-hmm. And um, it, you know, now looking at the, the people that I meet, because I'm interested in, in religious people, but I'll, I'll meet people that waited until marriage. Mm-hmm. And they'll tell me about their experience. And, you know, I, I only take them seriously if they've been married for a dime, you know. <laughs> okay. If they've got some time under their belt. <laughs> and I go, oh, man, you, you took something that felt good to me and was fun and kind of more like a, a product. Mm-hmm. And you ritualized it and made it, you elevated it to something beyond the human world Mm -hmm. and there's so you know not that i would tell people or especially tell young people like you should Mm -hmm. wait till marriage i don't i don't think that's necessarily the right way but but the the idea of making sex more important than the physical experience you know i I feel like in in modernity right now we're kind of exploring what the unintended consequences are on the other side there are many and i'm not saying that one's better than the other right but yeah 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 it's 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 interesting and it's difficult to know sometimes like what is uh, what's the right path whether it's sexually or religiously or whatever but but what i hear you saying is you know, we started with those questions of like all these christians raise their hands about doubt you know w- one of the deaths that we experience in this life is when we don't have any doubt like as soon as i'm sitting across from my wife and i feel I know what she's going to say. I know what she's going to do. I know what's going on with her. As soon as it becomes predictable and I feel like I know the whole thing, that's the end of the marriage. You know, it's only when I am curious and and, surpri- and willing to be surprised by her and not have, not seeing her through my own image of her that she becomes this exciting, interesting thing. And the same is true of faith and the same is true of my own belief system or my own sense of self. There, when you said there needs to be something in there about doubt, and what I love, you know, when you, you know, we have caricatures of, of Christianity and caricatures of religion, but when you get into the stories of Christianity, there's doubt all over the place. There's people doubting. I mean, even like I think it's in the end of the book of Matthew, it's like, and, you know, he's he was risen from the grave and all this stuff. And then it says, but some doubted. <laughs> it's one of the last lines, you know. And it's like, why did they put that in there? Like, if you were going to really do some some good propaganda, you would get rid of that line. But it but because that's part of it too, you know. Some doubted whether this they hadn't just been fooled by whatever the hell just happened, and I think that keeps us awake and listening and wondering and learning either about another person or, or about ourselves or about the world around us. So let's you know we don't have a necessarily Christian audience. I'm sure there's plenty, yeah. plenty of Christians in the audience, but I, I am interested in your coming back to faith because. I think that there's something universal in there and like figuring out what matters to you. And so what was it like to come back into? uh, Well, I never, I mean, I wouldn't say I lost my faith. I I would say all the structures I had. Some doubt it. Yeah, yeah, well, 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 all the, yeah, right. All the structures I had for who God was, who I was, what the faith was, that all fell apart. But like I said, when I looked down at my heart, my heart still trusted 
I, I mean, maybe it's the same in a, a relationship that goes really wrong, where it's like, I know I don't know who you are anymore. Like some terrible thing happens. I don't know who you are anymore. I don't know who I am. I don't know what this relationship is. But then you look down. It's like I'm still in. I still love you. I still want to keep going. It's kind of like that. So I didn't really have words for what faith was. I didn't. I thought I I could feel I was full of bullshit in a lot of ways. But my heart still moved in that. In this was was still believing. And what I mean by that is. I guess I don't really, I guess I, I guess words like belief, I just heard myself say believing. I don't really, I don't believe, I would say. I know. And I don't mean that in an arrogant way. But I know my kids love me. Now, they may get angry or attack me or say, I'm not going to speak to you for five years, but I know underneath that we love each other, right? When you sit in silence and contemplation and you do some of these practices where you're, where you're actually deciding, I'm going to try to meet God or I'm going to try to just lay myself out here in, my, in the mess that I am and see if there's anything real here. When you do that time and time again, you feel something real and it can't be named and the religion doesn't name it well, but there's some truth there. And I couldn't deny that I had experienced those things even if I had no structures for it, that makes sense. So, so my, my loss of faith was a loss of my own constructions of faith. I still know there is mercy within mercy within mercy somewhere in the center of all this because I've experienced it at different times when I was desperate. And, um, and it would be a lie to tell you I haven't touched that. You know, even though I wouldn't trust anything I say. <laughs> if that makes any sense. You know? So without using any Christian imagery, what is God? Well, first of all, I'd say reality. Um, reality. And, and I rarely live in it. I'm mostly in a false reality. I'm mostly an illusion, uh, living in illusion. So it's it's some it's the real within the real, which can be really dark, you know. Death is real, so you know it's so it's reality. It's also, I would also call God sort of the loving companion. There's some. I don't know when your son was little, if he followed you around when he was two or three years old, and would tag on your pant leg or something, you know, just didn't want you to be far. God's something like that for me, just some quiet, loving companion that when things get quiet enough, it's just like, okay, I'm here. That's about all I know. <laughs> all right. That's a tough one. <laughs> you, know, you know, that's about all I know. And so, and so in, in the Christian faith, I watch, I'm watching this image, this, I'm watching this Jesus trying to, to stay connected to that reality, trying to stay in the real, trying to stay close to what's loving and generative in the midst of violence or false projections or messed up hurting people. I'm watching him do that. And I, when I see that and I read the stories, it, it tells me, yeah, that's the struggle I want to be in, in my own way. You know, I want to try to stay in the real. and I want to stay honest. I want to try to be loving. So let's talk about your book. Okay. Yeah. Between the listening and telling. Uh, yes. Now that anybody who's been hurt or harmed or turned off by Christianity has now turned this, you know, stopped listening. <laughs> oh, yeah. And the Christians are mad at you. And the Christians are mad at me. Because your, I, I your guess, God is not their God. Yeah. Right? And I said some scary things there, too. So now it's just you and me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, one other. That and one, Reese. Right. And the one lonely person who's on a long drive, and this is the only podcast they have downloaded. The book... So the book is, so in all my work, like we're talking about contemplation and stuff, I, I trust experience. It's sort of like you and I were talking about when you were in Sunday school. Like I trust people and I trust what they're experiencing. So if you come in and say, I'm bored, I trust, I'm not going to tell you you're not bored. You're bored. Or if you tell me the beach is where life is, okay. You tell me, I feel like death is near, okay. I trust you. Um, I was interested in contemplative practices because it actually asked us to slow down and pay attention to what's here, to take a long, loving look at the real. What's real? And if we do that, 
We're going to come closer to what we're all longing for. The book is about story, and story is the way we communicate our experience. So, so like when you say, like, I, tell me your story, you know, you, you're trying to say, okay, you may be talking a lot of ideas, but what do you actually know? Like, what have you lived? What have you suffered? What have you overcome? That's exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And tell me the shit, you know, what's real for you and what do you actually know? Because, and, um, and even then I might not express it correctly, but story tries to, tries to say, you know, I saw my dad on these stages. I was kind of the 11 year old kid who wanted to say, how do I get to be with near this person? You know, how do I get to go backstage and be with my dad? You know, it, I'm trying to, that's what I know. <laughs> And I'm trying to help you, but I tell stories to help you feel it. And so the book is about the power of story for um, the way in which story helps us communicate our experiences to one another. This kind of beautiful thing we do where we're trying to say to one another, hey, this is what it feels like to be me. And every time I tell a story of parenting my daughter or, or falling apart in my faith, I'm in asking you, hey, would you come and feel like what it's like to be me? And in that transaction, I feel a little less alone, more myself. I kind of come home to myself in that interaction. So I, so I did this story. I've done this story work with communities, with people uh, who are suffering from school shootings or going through climate change or, or going through personal crises, trying to use story as a way to bring about healing and liberation. Yeah, I, th I think in a way, like, we are stories. Yeah. Like more than we are meat suits. Be yeah. Because someone dies and what are they, what's left is the story. Right. Of them, you know. Oh, yeah. did you hear Bob? Died? Oh, and then you start telling stories about Bob, you know, or, oh, did you hear about that stranger who died? The first thing you're going to do is talk about who he was. Or yes. She, or she was. Yes, yes, we're made of stories that way. And, and, and definitely some of my Native American friends would say that's completely true. It's all story. And the truth is that that's all we are is a story. Yeah, absolutely. feels like that. One of, the interest, one of the interesting things I noticed, we just cut an ad for this studio, Square One Studio, we're trying to rent it out to people. Yeah. Uh, basically, I'm trying to steal, convince people not to write a memoir. Huh. Because I end up with piles of memoirs that I don't want to read. Right. And I'm like, hey, just come into the studio, sit down in front of our camera, tell your story. We'll help you figure out the narrative. Like, let's just get it out. Yeah. It'll be like a week process. It will yeah. not be three years of shaming yourself for not writing enough. But anyway. Well, and, and then what a gift that is, because um, well, there's something you're doing with that is, you know, when we tell stories, I call it full body meaning making. So if I tell the story well you're tearing up when I tear up, your body's tensing when I tense. And part of that is because you're listening to the tone of my voice, you're, you're, you're noticing my body language, that kind of stuff. So if you're here in this studio filming people and catching their voices, when those stories are giving to their relatives, they can, it, it's, it's more accessible. I can feel what my grandfather was trying to say about, oh, yeah. about when he got fired the first time because I'm watching his eyes, I'm hearing his voice and the catch in his throat when he talks about falling in love the first time. And that all communicates to my body. It's about to get really cool in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's also self-serving because that's the kind of, that's what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Like that's what I, you know, if you leave me in a cafe and I end up talking to the person next to me, that we're going to end up doing that anyway. You're going to, you're going to ask them for their story. <laughs> yeah. <about. I'm> like, <laughs> 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 so, but it's also, you know, as somebody who, is, is interested in death, getting to, to hear people's tellings of their lives and what they gathered and what was meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not only are they giving their relatives or their friends or even strangers who come to the memorial or beyond a gift, uh, they're also giving me a gift as well. Yeah, That's yeah. So yeah, I call, I call the book Between the Listening and the Telling, and there's something, there's a kind of a sacred exchange right? When that's kind of what probably what happens on this podcast you're, you're hoping for is that someone is willing to tell you, here's what I've lived. Here's what I've, you know, uh, gone through and you're giving the gift of listening. And, and so are the people on, you know, who are listening to this podcast are giving this, they're um, offering their attention. 
that's their gift. And the, and the gift of the one speaking is to offer their human experience. And story is the way we do that, you know? Yeah. What, what I was going to say is there's a part in the ad, right, where I'm, t- I'm just like, it's like a kind of smash cut, right? There's like four okay. scenes happening at once as I'm narrating. And so I say um, tragic stories, sad stories, great stories, uh-huh. and stories that you can't t- keep your eyes off of. So in the sequence, it's like Russia invading Ukraine is what goes up on the screen when I say tragic stories. Mm -hmm. And then for sad stories, it's like another round of lockdowns or something pandemic related. And then for the good story, I had no idea what to put there. (laughs) None. Zero. Because I'm not looking for good stories to me. I'm looking for, I was looking for like, oh, what's that like pop culture in the zeitgeist thing we all celebrated. Uh Uh-huh. Right. And I texted 10 brilliant people. Mm -hmm. And they would say something and go, that's, you know, that's exciting for the Republicans. Or that's exciting for you lefties. Right, right, right. uh, That's not a shared good story. And it really, man, I was super depressed for three days. Well, it's true. We, we don't really have a shared story right now, you know. We um, don't have a shared good story. Yeah, right. Yeah. It, it's all zero-sum gain. You know, your side loses so we can win or vice versa. So it's like these trades, you know, th- these trade-offs right. of good stories. You know, oh, the, the environmentalists are going to make, you know, we got a great story now. And then, oh, now the free market guys are going to have a great story now or whatever it is. You know, you know we're... It's, and you know, it's not, you know, for bad stories, I think we, we have an easier time for some bad stories. You know, you, I think a lot of people can point to tragedies and say, hey, that's tragic. Right. But it did make me sad and um, d- did get me going like, wow, like when I was a, a kid, there was a lot of, I, the, did you see Top Gun? The, the new one? Yeah. No. The new Top Gun is a perfect Top Gun. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Why is it a perfect Top it's Gun? It's perfect. Okay. It's absolutely. It's exactly what Hollywood should be doing. Okay. Give us these kinds of experiences. Yeah. So, so what is, why do you call it that? They, it, it's feel good. Okay. You know, the the, the enemy is like unnamed. Okay. Right? Okay. Um, it's like just some bad Thrilling. country. But it doesn't say yeah. this Iran or this Russia or this China. Oh, okay. Uh, but it's just, it's just a, a joy ride. And and you leave feeling great. Well, yeah, and and you know, so how great? I mean, I I feel like what you're longing for, like when you talk about like we're in these times where we have your story versus my story, and we're these political divisions and and everything else. What can happen, right? If you and I go to that cafe you were talking about, and we start telling stories, we could f- feel a sense of connection, you know, just in you telling me your story of making art and. And I'm listening to that and trying to feel that. And I'm telling you my story of writing this book. And we feel each other's lives. That space is what this book's about, trying to create that space where we can grassroots storytelling, you know, tell the ground truth to one another. And, and I believe we can get beyond those divisions when we actually sit in a circle and tell our stories uh, to one another. And I think we're all longing for that, just like we might all be longing for Top Gun. <laughs> you know, that experience where... Everybody in the audience is cheering, and you don't know that your political enemy is right next to you. And everybody's experiencing at the same time the kind of the thrill of what's happening in that movie. We long for that to happen between us, too, you know? Yeah, well, I I would actually come back at you and say we're all longing for someone else to do it. But what's true is that, you know, everybody wants some kind of, like, revolutionary moment right where one figure comes forward and just says something so goddamn fucking brilliant and perfect and articulate that everybody just agrees yeah we should do that right but the truth is that you know it's like all great movements that have ever done anything were incrementalists yeah you know you can look at the revolutionaries it always ends badly (laughs) (laughs) it always ends badly you know, you can have a great revolution and you, 
you, you know, you got the new political structure you want and oops, nobody knows how to keep fresh water coming or keep right. the, keep the farms working. Or right. So these incremental moments are really where it's at. It's not up to a podcaster. It's not up to a, a celebrity. It's really up to you and your local community, but we've been sold a terrible lie, mm -hmm. which is that we are like one thing and, and yeah. we're not one thing. We're a ton of different communities and like the, the national news, especially in the corporate news has very little to do with what's going on in your life day to day. Oh, and it's oh, exactly. all about who, you know, your town council runs and mm -hmm. it, it goes from there. You know, it's all about the guys who show up on Sunday and weed the median that the government doesn't, mm -hmm. you know, or the city workers don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, so the question is for me is like, so how do you get, and we, and if you go to those town council meetings or whatever, it's like when you came to Sunday school class, like nobody wants to be there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like everybody's bored. Even the people, it's their job or they're covering it for the newspaper or whatever, you know. And so how do you get to the real within the real? And what I'm interested in is asking questions that invite people to tell the truth and to, to feel their humanity. So, so and, and how do you transform those spaces? So if I had ran a town council, I would start the thing by saying, okay, What's one interaction you had with a neighbor today that um, where you felt really connected to another person in our town? And people would tell those stories. You know, well, it's kind of funny. I go down this, you know, to the dog park and I, I met Sam there. We both had a dogs and you know all this kind of stuff. You would tell those stories, and you would people would go from caricatures into a dull space that's kind of in one part of our brain to to feeling the full humanity of one another. And suddenly. Um, those lines between who's in and who's out and, and what matters and what doesn't matter start to dissipate. And now you can focus on something a little deeper, but we're all just living in this very small part of ourselves most days, you know? Yeah. And I think we're also pulled into other people's stories. Mm -hmm. Right. You, you swimming by the media and oh, the media, the company you work for. Yeah. Right. So you like, you wake up and you show up at the company and then there's a company story, like whatever you work for. Mm -hmm. Oh, Hey, we're, you know, we're doing such a great job yeah. and uh, we've grown this year or we're doing really bad, you know, and yeah. this is a very scary time. And, um, you know, that, that's not your marriage and that's not your relationship with your children. And it's so, so there's all these kind of, you know, I feel like you have a limited space for story and there's an infinite amount of stories yes. that you can grab immediately. Like when, when people listen to this program, and specifically, um, what I want more is rather than rather than hearing Mark and going, well, that's an interesting story, uh, is to actually dialogue with with your ideas and what you're saying, and like they they might come to a totally different understanding than what you're saying or mm -hmm. what I'm saying. But there's a, it's not about my story and it's not about your story. It, it when you listen to stories, yes, there's a chance for empathy and compassion. But you're also, you're having a dialogue with that story because mm -hmm. you're comparing it to your story and you're comparing it to your frame of the world. And they, ha they have the ability to, to change each other in, mm -hmm. in positive and negative ways. Yeah. Now, now, so here's the way I would go about that, though. I mean, this is, this is my perspective on this. So this is my... It's your book. We're my end of the dialogue. Yeah. yeah. You get a group of people together and you say, okay, we're going to talk about immigration. Should we build the wall or not build the wall? Or should we let in more immigrants or less immigrants? People are going to show up and they're going to, they already have their minds set and they're going to have their arguments set. And I'm already ready for you to argue for this perspective because I'm going to counter it with this, right? And we don't get anywhere. You get a group of people together and you say, okay, tell, tell the immigration story from your family. Oh, well, my grandfather came over in whatever, 1892. And we tell those stories it puts us in a different, it gives us a different experience of one another. When I'm arguing about immigration, I'm in one tiny part of myself. I'm just in this, in my analytical brain. But when you're telling me the story of, you know, your, your grandparents who came over and immigrated um, and what it was like for them to start their first business, 
that story, I'm, my whole body is feeling it. I'm seeing the food they ate, the house they lived in, the job, they, and I'm feeling your humanity. Now there's a setting where we can address issues more holistically and something alive can happen, creative can happen. Well, f- unfortunately, in, in this culture, we're just always stuck in that tiny little part of ourselves, this analytical part. And nothing will change as long as you only address that part of me. You know, it's when, you know, I got, in my lifetime, I've watched us go from, um, you know, if anybody even indicated that they might be in the smallest way gay, their life could be in danger in this high school right now. <laughs> you know, to, now we have gay marriage. One of, the way that, one of the ways that happened is LGBTQ people started telling their stories. And people started hearing the stories and you couldn't deny. I mean, I remember sitting in rooms where people were against this and then somebody would stand up and tell their story. And I would, I couldn't help it, but I could feel empathy for them. I could see myself in their story. I could feel those longings. And suddenly the ideas I had in my head kind of were shattered. And I had to come up with a new conception of the world and of human beings. That's how, that's the power of story that I'm trying to work with in this book. It's beautiful. Yeah. So, I like to end the podcast the same way every time. And it's an opportunity for you to, to get your storyteller hat on. Uh, okay. If I could hand you a phone right now, and on the other end was you, at any moment in your life that you would like to talk to and dialogue with, maybe tell them a story, what would, that, what would the story be? And, and you can say it as if you're, you're speaking to yourself. If I'm speaking to myself in another moment in my yeah. life. Mm-hmm. So it could be during your dark, dark night of the soul. It could be. Um, no, I know what I would do. I would call um, there that the time in my life right before the dark night, I was working way too much. And I really abandoned my wife in that time. She had, was home with three kids. I was traveling like crazy. I was trying to live the life my dad had lived and I was imitating it. And I felt really disconnected from myself and it was really hard on her and so if i could i would call that 30 year old self and say don't recreate the wounds that that you encountered you know remember what it was like when your dad was gone all the time don't do that to your wife don't do that to your kids there's another way i know it feels like you have to do that you don't you can make a different choice and follow the love that's, that, uh, and receive the love that's available to you instead of searching for it on the road. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> and where can we buy, pre-order or buy your book? And where can we yeah. find you? If, well, if it comes out. It comes out on August eighth. Um, you can go to markyacanelli.com or you can go to the nonprofit that does story work called the Hearth Community. And I'm going on the road with this book. So I'm coming to little towns and churches and bookstores around the United States. So the tour dates will be set there. And you can pre-order it now? You can pre-order it. Perfect. And you can come to events where I'll, well, actually, it's not going to be me talking. It's going to be me getting you to tell stories. So I hope people will show up to that as well. I have one question. I should have left some space there. But I have one question that I want to cut into the episode that I'm realizing. So as somebody that works with young people, hopefully to try and influence them in a positive way. Mm-hmm. What is the, like if, if you were in, if you're trying to distill, listen, this is, this is what I want you to know is really important about being a healthy adult in the world. What are, what are the qualities or virtues that you're trying to, to really emphasize for these young people? Yeah. I mean, there's two, two things I would I have so many things I want to say to young people, but I guess what I would say is uh, what you are feeling and experiencing matters. You're not crazy. Um, and it's important what you're thinking about and what you're feeling, even though it feels maybe secretive or you can't tell anybody. Look for friends and adults who uh, who you can trust and Wait until the time's right and tell them what's really going on inside you. If you can find one other person who can listen to what's going on inside you that you trust, um, it makes all the difference. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Sam. It's nice to reconnect again. 
It, it was. I'll be looking for the next sculptor. <laughs> sculptor. Oh, I have you to wait a yeah. second. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello, humans. Thank you for listening to the How to Human podcast. Thank you for your feedback and your reviews on iTunes. Please get in touch with us if you enjoyed the show. We're reachable. You can go to our website, hellohumans.co, and get in contact with us. We're growing. We're learning how to produce the best possible hour-ish segment that reminds you that being human is such a gift, and it's a mess. And sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's terrible. And the light of consciousness of being a human is a whole experience worth experiencing in itself, good and bad. So please don't be a stranger. If you'd like to get really intimate with us, join our Patreon for any amount. You're part of the community, whether it's a dollar or 50 or 200 a month. You get access to everything. We try to post the videos of these episodes on the Patreon, which if you're like me, that information, that visual information might be important and inf and interesting to you and we also have regular gatherings we do a book club for now we plan on doing more types of gatherings in the future but we do a really sweet book club we read a book together it's a great little ragtag group of people who come together to be together in the human experience and people are from all walks of life it's a really beautiful little community um you can also follow us on Instagram if you like getting little snippets of these conversations or things that we're working on. And you can write us a review on iTunes, which lasts forever and is really fun for me to wake up to on Mondays and read the new reviews of the podcast. So if you enjoyed the show, it'd mean a lot to me if you took the time to review it. I know it's kind of a pain in the butt. How to humans on iTunes or the podcast app, please. I would love your review. And again, if you enjoy this and would like to take an active role in producing new episodes and also influencing new episodes by gathering with me in the book club and helping me sort out some of the ideas that I'm having and our other members of the book club are having, please become a patron, www.patreon.com slash howtohuman. I hope to see you there. I hope you have an amazing rest of your day. And until next time. Be well. This was recorded at Square One Studio in San Anselmo, California. For more information, you can go to square, the number one, dot studio. That's a website. You're just going to have to trust me.